welcome to Emmanuel this morning. We are glad that you are here with us, worshiping with us this morning. Now some of you are going to cringe when I say the next word, but I'm going to talk about school a little bit. I know you younger ones. Um, some of you may have had a stressful week trying to get your kids prepared, get your kids out the door, uh, ready for school. Or the last couple weeks, maybe some of you had college kids that are <coughs> moving out of the house and that makes you nervous or makes them nervous, but starting a new life basically away from their parents. Um, and some of you may have been lucky enough, if I can say that for the kids, that have not started school yet. They have a, a few days yet before that. I know Sheldon Christian is one of them that is out there that is after Labor Day this year. So um, needless to say, there's maybe a lot of stress going on in your life right now, but we are so glad and we welcome you to worship this morning here at Emmanuel. Please rise as we will read our call to worship. Come, let us all worship and bow down together. Let us kneel together before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Talking about ourselves as sheep brings to mind Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. As you come into worship today, the Lord has called you here to restore your soul. And so he greets you with a blessing, grace, mercy, and peace to you. From God our Father, from our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who's present and active in your hearts and in your lives. Amen. If you would please then welcome others into this place of restoration this morning and greet one another this morning. Yeah. 
because of him, God, that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast. Almighty God, please join me. We confess that we are often swept up in the tide of our generation. We have failed in our calling to be your holy people, a people set apart for your divine purpose. We live more in apathy born of fatalism than in passion born of hope. We are moved more by private ambition than by social more of privilege and benefits than of service and sacrifice. We try to speak in your name without relinquishing our glories, without nourishing our souls, without relying wholly on your grace. Help us to make room in our hearts and lives for you. By your Holy Spirit, forgive us, revive us,
so we have begun on this journey in worship as we do each week. We come in because God calls. And we are amazed as he receives us with grace. But we also know that we don't always follow his way. And so we come admitting that. And then again, God lets that grace overflow to restore us, to reconcile us, to remind us who we are not on our own, but who we are in Christ. And brothers and sisters, this is who you are. Just receive these words. You don't need to read them with me, but receive these words. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. God's own people, in order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. You once were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. People of God. All of us together have received God's mercy in Christ. In Christ we are forgiven, redeemed, and made to be a community united in faith. Thanks be to God. A community united in faith. And so we, as we gather together today, let's talk about that community a little bit. First of all, if uh, you're new to this place, we'd love it if you would fill out that little connection card that's in your bulletin and drop that in the offering plate in just a couple minutes so that we can get to know you as part of this community. Second, this last week we had a couple real uh, significant health things. Uh, we're praising God that uh, Jerry Vent Hall was able to go home and just pray that God would continue to uh, strengthen him. Uh, Rod Vanderbrake was actually able to go home last week Saturday and Praying God would strengthen him. And then you probably heard this week, if you followed emails and such, um, Fred Wolber had blood clots in his lungs. Um, they feel like they've got that mostly resolved, and Fred is actually home again as well. And we're praising God for that and for sparing him with, from what was a dangerous situation. But praying that they understand the cause. They're treating the symptom, but they're still working to figure out exactly what the cause is. So pray that that would, uh, would come to light soon. Um, just a couple other things. Uh, September 8 is not very far away. You know, we, we're starting school either last week or this week for just about everybody. Um, but uh, our Sunday school and catechism, gems, cadets, youth groups, small groups, all that stuff for us starts kind of into September. And uh, September 8 is the beginning of the small group series. I encourage you just to make the preparations you need to for that. Uh, if you're looking for a group, talk to Jenna. Um, and then that's when our Sunday school and catechism and all those things kick off. So uh, keep that in mind. And then uh, one reminder, a little special treat after worship today. If you've got a few minutes to, to stay, uh, Carrie Kampoff is going to share a bit about her uh, trip to Guatemala. And we're looking forward to uh, hearing that, Carrie, and uh, invite you all to stay for that. Um, Micah is coming up here a moment. He wanted to have a, say a word on behalf of the deacons this morning. All right, good morning. Yes, my name is Micah. I'm one of the deacons here on the council. And I was thinking about community and what that involves. It involves a lot of things. Being part of a community means you know about each other, right? You share information about each other. Being part of a community provides a place in which we can be accountable to each other. Um, being part of a community means we celebrate and share joys together. And being part of a community, along with a lot of other things, also involves carrying burdens together, like Pastor Kevin um, just shared some concerns from our congregation. So with those things in mind, I just want to direct your attention uh, to the deacon's page. You don't need to pull it out now, but hopefully after the service or later this week, you can take a closer look. And there's some things that the deacons and the council want to share with you. There are certainly many joys to share. If you look at the deacon's page um, for this month, some tremendous offerings. And in fact, this congregation has a history of giving very well. I 
think about some tremendous gifts that were made for Jalapa this year and for uh, disaster relief response when the floods hit. Um, we've met our CES obligations for the year. We just have a really good tradition of giving well for some of those causes, and that's a great joy. But we also have to share information, and we have to um, work together for the work of the church, because the community involves a lot of things, putting the lights on, paying the staff, making this place go. And in particular, I'm referring to the general fund, fund budget. Um, this year, to date, our income is about 155000 which is a big number. The concern is that year to date, our actual expenses exceed that by over $15,000. And it's always good to have a point of reference. Last time at this year, our giving was further ahead by over $18,000. So we know it's the tail end of the summer, and we have a history of being a little bit lighter in giving over the summer, but we want to keep that information in front of you. So we encourage you to look at the blue sheet when it comes out to um, consider prayerfully those causes that we support, what it takes to make this community run. And um, we just thank you for God's generosity to us and that we would hold each other accountable and share in those joys and concerns together. So on behalf of the deacons and the council, just uh, thank you for giving me a moment to um, share that with you. And with that, um, I'll pray before the offering and we'll take a prayer for Sealand, uh, or we'll take an offering for Sealand um, Community Church. Dear Heavenly Father, you are great and good, and we praise you for that. Lord, you bless us with so many good gifts, and we pray that um, as we see those gifts, as we use those gifts, that um, we would be thankful to you, but most of all, we would treasure you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that your church is so big. We thank you for calling people of every tribe and tongue to be part of your people. We thank you that in Sheldon and our surrounding communities, we can be a little part of that church. And we thank you for the work of Siouxland Unity Church in Sioux City, especially with the Lao community there. We thank you that your church is bigger than even that, that it's worldwide, and that uh, we would support it and love it and do what we can in it for your glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
as Shauna so nicely reminded us, it's back to school time. Uh, most of the elementary schools and high schools started Friday. Some have another week. Uh, for the colleges, last week uh, NCC at Northwestern started. This week it's Dort and the USD. And some of you, probably most of the college students and maybe the lower elementary, cannot wait for school to begin. And of course others are less excited. And maybe a few even have to be coerced. The Bible passage that we're looking at today is all about education, and it's actually a story of coercion as well, and resistance to some of that coercion on the one hand, and yet taking advantage of a world-class education that's offered on the other hand. So this morning our scripture comes out of Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried away to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them in the treasury of the temple of his God. Then the king said to Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. He was to teach them the literature and language of the Babylonians. So they brought in young men without defect, handsome, with aptitude in every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the palace of the king. He was to teach them the language and learning of the Babylonians. And the king set aside an amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years and then enter the service of the king. Among them were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, the name Shadrach. To Mishael, the name Meshach. And to Azariah, the name Abednego. Now, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the food from the king's table. So he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the chief official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But he said to Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? Then he would have my head because of you. Daniel asked the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please, test us for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And at the end of ten days, compare us to the other young men. And then do according to what you see. So the guard agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they were healthier, they appeared healthier and better nourished than all the young men who ate the king's food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. 
and God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding of every kind of literature and learning. And Daniel was able to understand dreams and visions of all kinds. When the time was up for them to be brought in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king talked with them. And he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the service of the king. And in every matter about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters of his whole kingdom. And Daniel stayed there until the first year of King Cyrus. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We ask now that you would speak to us through your scripture. Lord, I pray that you would use my words and you would make connections with your word to our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The setting is the Middle East, some 600 years before Jesus walked on the earth. The Babylonian Empire, centered in what's now Iraq, is the power in the region. Jehoiakim is king of Judah, and the kingdom is slipping out of his grasp. Against the Lord Yahweh's specific command, Judah's leaders decided that they were going to ally themselves with Egypt against Babylon. And Egypt was the rival of Babylon, and so now Egypt has drawn the attention of the great war leader and king Nebuchadnezzar. And on his way home from a devastating campaign against Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar decides he'll humble little Judah as well. That's important to note that the hand of the Lord is involved in this as well. The Lord is the only God beyond compare. He is the only controlling power in the universe. And the Lord could have protected little Judah had he wished. But those people who were supposed to trust his all-powerful sovereign hand to protect them fail to trust And among many other things, they run to seek protection from Egypt instead. So after a short siege, the Lord delivers to Nebuchadnezzar, not only King Jehoiakim and the city, but even some of the articles of worship from the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. Now these were probably taken as as tribute, as a payment, with the threat that if Judah is not obedient to their new overlord, Babylonians, uh, the Babylonians will come back. And they'll take the rest, and they'll destroy the temple, and devastate the population. About 15 years later, that actually happens. But in this setting, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are taken into custody. And now, it was common practice to take from a defeated enemy some of their best and brightest to serve in the royal court. On the one hand, this gives you some hostages to threaten against any rebellion. That's why some of them are part of the royal family. It also gives you the resources of the best and the brightest from these other nations, and it gives you a window into understanding the people that you're now ruling. So these four and several others are taken to Babylon to learn the language and the learning and the literature of the Babylonians. And on the one hand, of course, this is coercion, right? They're, they're forcibly taken from their homes and they're relocated to Babylon to learn the language and the culture. On the other hand, they are given access to one of the greatest libraries in the entire world. The library in Babylon was a repository, the greatest repository of literature and history in the Middle East, which was at that time the heart of civilization. It was also the repository of all the Babylonian religious texts. So their every kind of learning would have involved the religions of Babylon as well. And I want you to see here, there's a conflict between the religion of Babylon and the religion of Judah, who were to worship the Lord, Yahweh. 
And this is one of those issues that kind of runs underneath the whole storyline of this text. Because first, Babylon defeats Judah in armed conflict. And now these four young men whose names honor God have their names changed to names that honor the gods of the Babylonians. El. You notice El on the end of a couple of those names. Mishael, Daniel. El stands for God. God Most High, the One God. We would say God with a capital G. Daniel means God is my judge. Mishael means who is what God is. In other words, there's no God like the Lord, the God of Israel. Hananiah and Azariah actually both begin with the first syllable of Yahweh, the name of the Lord in Hebrew. Now, do me a favor and don't ask me why one has an H and the other doesn't have an H or how Ha and Ah come from Ja, but it, it works. I can't follow through the various languages because we're actually going through about three or four languages by the time we get to English. Um, just know that Hananiah means Yahweh, the Lord, is gracious. And Azariah means Yahweh will help. For their new names, Belteshazzar, Bel or Marduk, it's a petition. Bel, protect his life. Shadrach means the command of Aku. Aku is the moon god. Meshach, related to his previous name, Mishael, is who is what not the Lord is, but who is what Aku is. And Abednego is a servant of Nebo, the second greatest god to Marduk or Bel. So the Babylonians are trying to assert the power of their gods. And it doesn't seem like these four resisted the name change. They, they probably saw it as inevitable. And it was not such an important thing. It was not something that defiled them. On the other hand, they resist eating the king's food. And now this seems curious to us. We don't really have food taboos, I mean, other than cannibalism. I mean, we, we resist the idea of eating horse or dog or rat, but we don't really see anything morally wrong with it. But Daniel considers eating that food an action that would defile them. So what's the big deal? A few chapters later, when they are supposed to bow down to an idol, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse, right? We, we talked about this at Kids Fest for you younger ones. A servant of the Lord can't bow down and worship an idol. But food? This gets back to the purpose of the Lord choosing a people for himself. It's not that Israel and later Israel and Judah were greater than any other nation, but God chose them for a purpose, to have a relationship with them through which the Lord our God would show himself to all the people of the world. That's the purpose of God's people, Israel and Judah. And it's a failure to carry out this task that brought punishment upon Israel. The last one being, we don't trust the Lord's power, we're going to run to Egypt. Now because of their purpose to show the Lord to the nations, God's people needed to uh, maintain a separation uh, from the peoples of the world. Not all get mixed together. And by the way, just a side point, this has no place today. Don't look to the Bible for support for racial reconciliation, because if we read it, all together appropriately it actually teaches just the opposite people from every tongue and language and tribe and people and nation part of God's people but because God is showing himself through the people of Israel one of their key things was not get mixed together and one of those things was their food laws there were certain foods they couldn't eat they couldn't eat pork they couldn't eat things like eel um, and there were special preparations for their food they're supposed to drain all the blood out of it now when these four boys probably about 14 years old are taken to be educated and prepared for royal service, they refuse to be defiled by the king's food. There would be foods served that they weren't allowed to eat. The other foods would be prepared in ways that weren't acceptable. And so, in regard to their food, Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah take their stand. So they don't eat those foods, and we do, so are we defiling ourselves? I don't believe so. 
Because it's, it's actions against God's commands that defile us. And God had specifically given to the people of Israel and Judah those commands to set them apart. And it's disobedience to God's instructions that defiles. That's not a word we use a lot. It makes us dirty, inappropriate, shameful. It's, it's actually especially a religious term where you take something that's used for sacred things and you use it for unsacred things. That's a good word. There's a better word for that. <sighs> but that's what's in mind here. These young men are sacred to God. He has a purpose for them to use them as part of his people to be showing himself to the world. And they refuse to defile themselves and disqualify themselves as God's servants, as God's vessels to be used. And now this is the same for us. Not food laws. God didn't apply those to the church after Jesus. And if you want to have a discussion about that, we can. But today is not the day. Or at least not right now. Um, but there are actions that defile us. And that's defying God's instructions. That's what makes us unworthy servants. I mean, what good servant doesn't obey his master's instructions? What good employ, employee doesn't carry out the boss's order? None. So Daniel, speaking for the quartet, asks Ashpenaz, that's a great name, isn't it? If I, if I ever get another dog, that might be the name for it. Uh, Daniel asks Ashpenaz um, for permission not to defile himself with the food. And he asks permission. I realize he's showing respect. This is not as adversarial as the situation might found. The young men are taken from home, but they're treated very well. The food from the royal table is actually a really a great gift. It's a privilege in a society where you know, many of the peasants are subject to hunger and malnutrition. And they receive education and access to that great treasure troves of knowledge in the library in Babylon. And the word translated guard, that's probably not a great translation. It's really more of a, of a male version of, you think of those old English governance, governesses. Um, you know, the companion, the supervisor, the teacher, kind of all rolled into one. And responsible for their education and socialization. So the actions of Daniel and his friends don't defile them. Instead, they actually define them. still in a respectful way and and don't think that when daniel went from ashpenaz to the guard like he was going in secret okay they're probably right there together can we not defile ourselves with the food i'm afraid of the king what's he gonna think about your experience hey how about this how about you test us for 10 days and give us the food and respectfully seeking to um Respectfully seeking to follow the Lord's commands. So Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah find a way within the boundaries set for them by their overseers to allow the Lord God space to act. I mean, they eat vegetables for 10 days. I'm not sure if that's really long enough to... Uh, see a change but the lord makes sure their appearance outshines that of their compatriots who eat the royal food this is one other example i tell you the sovereignty of god is running beneath this whole story another example of the sovereignty of god and his battle with the gods of babylon so the action this action to to maintain their their obedience to the lord's commands it defines these young men as those who are faithful to the Lord their God. And they set an example for us, especially as we are entering into those educational settings. Elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges. Settings where great learning is offered, but where we will also face the temptations to go against God, God's guidelines. The temptations might be offered by fellow students. To go the wrong way. Or might be the pressure of circumstances. Oh, I'm just so busy. I have to find a way to get through this. I'm going to find a paper out there on the internet that fulfills my assignment and put my name on it. The temptations can even be offered by teachers. As Ashpenaz with the royal food, he saw nothing wrong with it. He wasn't trying to make them defile themselves. It was a gift as far as he was concerned. 
but it wasn't right for Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. It was against the Lord's command for them. So these four stood for what was right. They knew the Lord's command for them as part of his people to be a set-apart people. And the laws that they, what they were and were not allowed to eat. So what is right? If we're standing for the right, what fits under the Lord's commandments? What fulfills the Lord's great commands to us to love God above all and the neighbor as self? Students ganging up to pick on others, creating a higher group and a lower group, something that's common in every school, it's not acceptable. Resist it. Cheating off someone else's work, copying papers from the internet, it's not acceptable. It's not right. Tutoring, helping someone understand an assignment, that's right. Standing up to a student or even a teacher who's bullying another student, that's right. I've got a quote from, and you'll realize as I read that this is a website directed especially to men. Standing up for what you believe to be right is not only right, but needed. Don't be the guy with his head in the clouds telling people how to live. But please be the friend who's man enough to take your pal by the arm and set him straight. Be the man willing enough to take a stance while all others sit in silence. And be the man open-minded enough to admit when you're wrong and rise to the challenge if you yourself are called out. So I have a guy by the name of Chad House. And there's another line from popular literature. It says, uh, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to your enemies and even more to stand up to your friends. Daniel and his friends stand up for what is right, but they also take this advantage of this opportunity to prepare for service. Even though they are in difficult circumstances, they're in a foreign land, they're, they're captives, even if they're well-treated. Think about the temptations of 14, 15-year-old boys. They're confronted by temptations of being cut loose from the moorings of their parents and their society, and they're away from their religion, and they take advantage of the opportunity to learn and to prepare for service. They learn the language of the Babylonians. They read the books assigned to them. All the while realizing that there are some ideas in them that are not right. The further you go in education, the more you're going to find that. You're going to read people with great understanding. But you're also going to realize that you don't agree and shouldn't agree with everything there. John Calvin was asked one time, he, he was questioned, why, the, why he, because he went back and read the Greeks, Plato and Aristotle, and, and people said, why are you reading that pagan stuff? And he says, all truth is God's truth. Sometimes we need to sort through it, but all truth is God's truth. So all of you who have the opportunity to go to school this fall, from preschool to graduate school, I want to challenge you to take advantage of the opportunity laid out for you. Whether it's in a public university or a Christian college, whether a Christian school or a public school, we are blessed in the United States and especially in this area to have great educational resources right at our fingertips. Take advantage of your opportunity to learn, no matter what the setting. It's an opportunity to prepare yourself for service to humanity and to service for God's purposes on this earth. If the Lord God could use the library of Babylon with all of its idolatrous religious texts and Babylonian teachers to prepare Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah for his service, he can use your college, your school, your elementary school, your middle school, your high school, your university as well. If we would read the rest of the book of Daniel, we would find that these four are used by the Lord in the service of the king of Babylon, but they're serving God in the midst of this ungodly organization. Daniel would often interpret visions that were messages from God to the king's court. 
and these three friends, we know them mostly uh, by their Babylonian names because we remember the other story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That when the king set up an idol and said everybody needs to bow and worship this idol, they refused. And because they refused, they were thrown into the furnace to be executed, except that didn't happen. The Lord saved them, and as they came out of that furnace, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, whose name is also one of those Babylonian names praising their gods, who set up the idol, says this. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except the Lord their God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Okay. We're doing pretty good there until the last uh, little bit, right? Uh, that last part, that's probably not the kind of praise the Lord would prefer. But Nebuchadnezzar sees God's hand, and he offers the Lord glory. What an unlikely source. What an amazing turn. Because of their faithfulness, God brings glory, his own glory, out of the mouth of this pagan king. Now, as they brought the word of the Lord into the court in Babylon, we can do the same. No matter how Christian or pagan the setting, the business, the organization, the government, the school, as we are willing to stand for what is right, as we are willing to be prepared for service, we can bring the voice of the Lord to that place, that place where we walk, that place where we work. And before we leave this story, I want to go back to the sovereignty of God that undergirds the whole thing. Because God is sovereign, we can act in obedience, in confidence, whatever our setting. God is sovereign all the time. No matter how strong the relative armies, it is the Lord God who decides who wins the battle. It is for his purposes that Judah is defeated, that the articles of the temple are removed, that the young men are taken away to Babylon. It is the Lord who causes Ashpenaz to have favor toward Daniel. It is the Lord who causes the 10-day test to work. It is the Lord who blesses the studies of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah so that they become the best in Babylon. And even their names undergird the message of the Lord's sovereign control of the situation. The chief official gave them new names. And those names will show up later. But in this chapter... It's the Hebrew names, the God-glorifying names of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah that are repeated multiple times. That's not by accident. It's not just to make, you know, the guy reading Scripture say those funny names over and over again. God is showing that even though their names are changed, their God and their loyalty to the Lord is not changed. And they can make this stand with confidence because the Lord is sovereign all the time and everywhere. That same truth must undergird our defining actions as we stand for what is right. And as we prepare for the Lord's service in school and throughout our lives. We can stand with confidence. Because the Lord is sovereign all the time and everywhere. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you this morning. Lord, we come to you this uh, week as we uh, look at schools that have begun and others who are beginning. Lord, we pray for those who are starting their semester at college. Lord, at USD, at NCC, 
at Northwestern, at Dort, other places as well. Lord, we pray that you would have them stand for what is right. And Lord, we pray too that you would also help them to take advantage of the great opportunities that are in front of them to learn and to grow and to have their skills sharpened. Lord, we pray for our schools. We pray for the Sheldon Public School, Lord, that you would give their teachers everything that they stand in need of to present their material well, to help the students learn, and to set them good examples for life. Lord, we pray for Sheldon Christian as they wait to uh, begin the school year. Lord, we pray that all the details with the, the remodel and the adding on would, would go well and would be handled in such a way that they would be able to start school on September 2nd or 3rd. Lord, we pray for Western and Unity, and we thank you for the opportunity to have Christian high schools. And Lord, we just pray that, that the students and teachers there might be shining lights and not let their light be dimmed because there are others around whose lights also shine. Lord, we pray that wherever we are, you would make us witnesses, witnesses for you, for your goodness, for your sovereignty. Lord, we pray that we would stand for the right. Lord, we pray that you would prepare us to serve wherever you place us. Lord, whether it's on the line at Rosaboom or whether it's in the coffee shop or whether it's in the front of the classroom or in a seat in the classroom. Lord, we pray that you would use us. And Lord, we pray that you would make us a unique people a holy nation set apart to proclaim the mighty acts of God. Lord Almighty, because you are in control of all things, we also come to you on behalf of those uh, who, who need uh, healing. Lord, we come on behalf of Fred and pray, Lord, that uh, you would guard him from more blood clots. Lord, we pray that you would allow doctors to come to an understanding of what's causing those so that they can, can treat it at a deeper level. Lord, we pray for Jerry. Just pray that you would continue to strengthen him day by day. Lord, for Rod and others who have been ill or suffered, Lord, we pray that you would restore them to strength and to health. And Lord, we thank you that you are the one God, eternal, almighty, and that you know us by name and call us to be a people set apart to proclaim your goodness. Lord, let us do this faithfully because we belong to you, because we know what Jesus has done, that he has given his life to restore us to you, to reconcile us to you. Lord, we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up and lead us as we close our worship service. The song is a translation of that prayer. Lord, I need you. Each one of us, each day as we walk this earth seeking one to be prepared to serve but two to stand for what is right we need god with us let's stand and sing together
When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. one more blessing from the Lord our God. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen.